He ran the most successful car theft ring in American history. He's a mastermind. He led a major enterprise that enabled him to make millions and millions of dollars. His tightly controlled organization stole thousands of luxury vehicles. They do it in a matter of moments. They are sophisticated. They know the latest technology on these high-end cars. The police couldn't stop him. He had tremendous discipline. This is what made him very good. And we had no idea who he was Find out how he did it, next on Masterminds. New York City has America's largest concentration of high-end cars. Manufacturers of these luxury vehicles have equipped them with an array of sophisticated security features, including motion detectors that sound off when the car is moved, recessed door locks to foil prying tools, an electronic engine immobilizer to prevent the car from being started without the proper key. And if thieves do manage to steal the vehicle, a global positioning device concealed in one of 25 secret locations allows police to track it. But in 1999, a massive wave of car thefts hits New York. We were losing cars at an unprecedented rate. In fact, we lost uh, 48 high-end vehicles in a span of six to eight weeks. The thieves are so efficient, cars are gone in a matter of seconds. They do so quickly, and they do so quietly, and they get away with it. They knew what uh, anti-theft devices they had to defeat. They had a plan. They were stealing the cars out of our driveways, out of our commuter lots, out of our malls, and we've got to put an end to it. Even more frustrating for police, the stolen cars weren't resurfacing. Generally, what you'll see is when a vehicle is stolen for parts, it will show up out in the street. We call it the bones. All the high-end parts are off the vehicle would be used for resale. What we discovered is they weren't showing up. The cars were simply disappearing. Which was kind of odd. And leads us, to, as an autocrime investigator, to believe the cars were being exported. Now the question was, where were they going? we learned that a number of the owners of these vehicles had Easy Pass in their vehicles. Now, Easy Pass is used as a form of payment when going through a toll. By studying the computerized records of the victim's last toll payment, a pattern emerged. The vehicles were going across the Triborough Bridge, and there's two locations they could have been going to, either Kennedy Airport or Brooklyn to be shipped out. Police ruled out the airport as an export venue because of the volume of vehicles. But they found nothing in their search of the Brooklyn shipyards. And the investigation hit a dead end. I knew early on that with the theft of these luxury vehicles that there was probably a very sophisticated professional car theft organization that was in operation and working in New York City. The mastermind police were looking for was a former intelligence officer in the Chinese army named Min Jin Yang. He stole and exported thousands of high-end vehicles and made himself over $40 million. The question is, how did he do it? <laughs> Former Chinese Army intelligence officer Min Jin Yang's career as America's greatest car thief starts 5,000 miles from the U.S. Discharged from the Army in the late 1980s, he moves to Shanghai, where there's a huge demand for luxury vehicles among the privileged class. But the cars are not sold in communist China. Seeing an opportunity to use the skills he honed investigating Asian smugglers, Yang approaches the Chinese underworld with a business proposition. He 
was able to convince people in China that he could bring them vehicles door to door in six weeks, which if you think about it, is about the time it takes to order a new car. Yang strikes his deal, a 60-40 profit split. The buyers give him a half million dollar advance to set up his operation in the city where the cars are, New York. You could steal a car in New York that's worth $60,000 and sell it in Asia for $120,000. Kenny knew that if he came to New York, that he could get the type of vehicles that these people wanted. It was a good shopping ground. Slipping into the country using false documents, Yang adopts the name Kenny and poses as a struggling immigrant. This was all part of his scheme, and that was that he would blend in. He didn't want to stick out. Drove an older Nissan Altima that was leaking oil. It was not flashy. Yang begins to execute his master car theft plan. He brings over a trusted associate from Shanghai, Poi Chow, to run the shipping operation. Chow's first task is to secure a warehouse where they can process the cars. It was important to find a warehouse as quickly as possible. But the warehouse had to be just right, because A, it had to be away from a police station. B, it had to be on the quiet side. C, it had to be in a place that was not going to attract attention. After weeks of searching, Chow finds the perfect location. Yang instructs him to lease the warehouse. They created a dummy corporation called MSK Group. And the purpose of having a dummy corporation was that if, in fact, there was an investigation of MSK Group, it would not come back to Ken Yang. He tried to separate himself so that if, in fact, uh, the walls came down, he would be protected. Yang then recruits more trusted Chinese associates. Those individuals were brought in by a Chinese organization out of Vancouver. They worked in the warehouse. They camouflage the operation as a food company by loading in dry goods near the doors. Then they outfit the building with a surveillance system. Yang is now ready for the next step, finding the best car thieves in New York. He didn't get his hands that dirty, but at the same time, he knew who to hire on the street to steal these vehicles. Yang talent scouts an accomplished New York car thief known only as Dean. He met Dean at an auction for salvage vehicles, developed a relationship with him, and then it was Dean who actually procured the professional car thieves. He just wanted me to deal with the car thieves, then I deal with him. That's how it all started. Dean knew a lot of individuals that would steal cars. One of his closest confidants was an individual by the name of Mario Lopez. It was basically a full part group. One part of the group was Dean passing along the orders to Mario Lopez, who then organized the theft of the vehicles. And the last part of the group was Asian-dominated shipping vehicles out. Yang has created an organization that leaves him unknown to all but his closest lieutenants. With every piece now in place, he gives the order for the thefts to begin. They would target high-end shopping malls, residential streets, commuter parking lots. Mario was capable of stealing a car at any time, at any place, and he did. Once the right car is found, Mario and his gang go to work. You open the door, it will shut down the computer. So you would have to break the glass, go in through the window. Lopez is a specialist at using computers to bypass security systems. He reprograms the car's engine immobilizer, allowing him to start the vehicle with a stolen generic dealer key. Dean's crew was very knowledgeable in the theft of high-end vehicles, and they did it very quick. The whole operation of stealing a car would only take maybe one or two minutes. With all of the anti-theft features now disabled, Lopez hands the car off. Mario stole numerous cars and kept on passing them off to backup drivers. After they stole the car, they would bring it to a good neighborhood where those types of cars wouldn't stick out. Yang instructs the thieves to electronically scan the car 
to determine if it is equipped with a global positioning device. Basically sends out a signal and lets the police know the location of the vehicles. The global positioning device is removed and discarded. But in case it's already been activated, the thieves leave the car. What Ken mandated was that all these vehicles had to be cooled down a couple of days. And once that vehicle sat there for two days, they knew the police weren't looking for it. Yang then orders Dean to have the car brought to the warehouse. This stage is also under his careful control. The delivery took place around rush hour. He wanted the cars to be part of the commute. Dean is instructed to have the drivers leave the cars a few blocks from the building. He doesn't want the car thieves to know where the warehouse is at. That's the main reason of parking the cars a couple blocks away. So only Dean and Mario would bring cars into the warehouse. But Yang has designed one final test to make sure the police haven't followed the vehicles. He has Dean continuously circle the block in the stolen car. They call it square the block. If somebody is following you, it becomes very obvious if they keep on making the same right turn or left turn that you're making. A second scout car circles a wider area, also on the alert for police. They had video cameras outside the warehouse, and they had monitors in the interior of the warehouse that they could look at, and they could monitor the traffic. He would have his guys bring the car into the warehouse when he feels that it's safe. From his vantage point on the street, Yang instructs Chow to open the warehouse loading bay. When the gates were open, the vehicles were brought into the warehouse, and the gate was closed. Now the warehouse team takes over. If the thieves did any damage to the vehicle, that would be fixed at the warehouse. They would actually repair the locks and cut keys. That vehicle, when it was shipped, was in showroom condition. The next step is to load the vehicles into land-sea containers that Yang has had delivered to the warehouse. These guys were very skilled. They used a couple of ramps to essentially load these cars into containers. Knowing the exact size of each stolen car, Kenny designs the perfect system for packing them. They would build a frame around it out of the two by fours and actually drive another vehicle underneath it. These cars were not moving around. They did not want to damage the merchandise. After gauging the exact weight of the packed container, Yang forges convincing manifests for the shipment. It would list as food product. The weight of the product would match the weight of what they were shipping. Once the container left the warehouse, it was trucked over to New Jersey. And in New Jersey, the container was put on a train, railed across the United States to California, and then put on a ship. The vessel heads for the East China Sea, where it's met by another ship. The containers are covertly transferred, then delivered to China, along with new manifests that detail their real contents. With military precision, Yang lands thousands of luxury vehicles. But a simple traffic accident will soon threaten to bring his multi-million dollar operation to a screeching halt. <laughs> For the past five years, Ken Yang has made millions smuggling stolen cars to China. But the demand for these vehicles is outstripping his ability to steal them. To boost the supply, he has Dean order Mario Lopez to start hitting car dealerships. Mario would go in, he would scout the dealership, take a test drive. He would spot where the car salesman would go to get the key out of the lock box. Several nights later, Mario returns to the dealership. And Mario would break in, go right to the box because now he knew where it was, take the keys. Mario's steel crew is waiting. In minutes, seven new luxury cars are driven off the lot. From the time the alarm went off, they would air three minutes later and everybody was gone. But one of the stolen cars gets into an accident after exiting the Triborough Bridge. When police arrive on the scene, 
they discover the vehicle is stolen. The driver is arrested and turns on his fellow thieves. And based on this accident, that led us to Dean. An investigation of Dean eventually directs police to Ken Yang's warehouse. We understood there was an export operation in a warehouse in Brooklyn. And we set up on that warehouse. We did surveillances of that warehouse. Unbeknownst to us, they were doing counter surveillance in the area. Yang soon discovers the police are on to him, but he's prepared. His operation is designed to fold quickly. Ken had tremendous discipline. This is what made him very good. He felt that we were on to him, he just disappeared. When police make their move, they find the warehouse abandoned. The warehouse basically was emptied, and he was gone. And we had no idea who he was, where he went to, or anything. Everything goes quiet. But police put a tap on Dean's phone. What we would hear on the phone would be, people would always be asking Dean, one of the Asians coming back, one of the Asians coming back. Hoping to take down the whole organization, the police hold off on arresting Dean. On the one hand, uh, we wanted to, to build a case against as many professional car thieves as we could. On the other hand, we wanted to learn where the vehicles were going, ultimately. Six months later, Yang resurfaces. Basically, Ken comes back to New York. He makes a phone call to Dean. It's a very cryptic phone call. I'm back. I have an order for 260. Fearing he's being tapped, he orders the gang to keep changing their phones. These are individuals who are very sophisticated. They were involved in disposing of cell phones. So even though we were up on 14 wires at one point, we had to constantly change and amend the wires, which requires court approval to keep up with their disposing of their cell phones. We knew who they called, so we waited for them to call, say, a parent or a girlfriend from the next phone. And that would give us the number of the phone they were currently using. And then we would get a wiretap on that phone. He thought that by changing cell phones, by not using his address, that he could hide his identity. His cronies constantly made mistakes by alluding to where they would have lunch. Police send an Asian undercover officer to Yang's business lunches. For the first time, they get a look at the mastermind. We could listen into the conversations. It gave us a window into the world of Ken Yang and his group. And so when we learned that they were looking at this warehouse, we sprung into action. Kenny was setting up to fulfill another order. We were setting up to catch him. We knew that we did not want police presence in the area if we could help it. So instead, what we did is we mounted cameras. We mounted cameras on telephone poles. We mounted cameras on buildings. Police even managed to put a locating device into one of the containers to find out where the cars are going. We worked with the New York State Police, the New York City Police Department, local police. I mean, this was an effort that was years in the making. So we had all of our bases covered. For the first time, police have Ken Yang clearly in their sights. But unaware of their surveillance, Yang continues to ramp up operations with an ingenious scheme that targets parking garages. Most parking garages in Manhattan, you leave the keys with the car. This way they can move the vehicle around if another car has to get out. Now, parking garage attendants in Manhattan don't make a lot of money. Mario Lopez had formed an alliance with a parking garage attendant, and a deal was hatched for Mario Lopez to steal a number of cars from that garage. They would pay him $500 for the most high-end cars that he had in his garage. So the time was arranged. After getting the keys to these vehicles from the parking attendant, they duct taped them and they left him in the garage. They then drove away with seven cars. After somebody came down, saw this poor parking garage attendant tied up, they called the police. And 
fact, by the time the police arrived at the parking garage, the cars were already at the warehouse. By asking for more and more cars to be delivered, they made some mistakes. They got sloppy. They got greedy. They wanted the cars to come into the warehouse, and they didn't allow the cars to cool off. One of the stolen cars in the warehouse has a GPS system that alerts police. The responding officer walks straight into the surveillance operation. We were watching on camera. We were watching what was taking place. There was nothing we could do to stop it. We knew this police officer was going to walk in the door. The workers that are in the facility take off. So at this point, we realized we had to act, and we had to act fast. We set up on Kenny's house. We had a car on each corner, and one car down a block. A oriental gentleman leaves the house. We ID'd him as Kenny. At that point, a, a decision was made to stop him. Ken Yang is arrested and charged with multiple counts of car theft. But for police, there was one sour note. Because of the, the takedown coming prematurely, we never really were able to determine where the cars were being sold. At his trial, Yang pleads guilty to enterprise corruption and is sentenced to 10 years in prison. His downfall was that we were smarter than he was. We've sent a message to car thieves in this county and the surrounding area that we have intelligence, that we know what you're doing, that we have the ability to bring you down, and that we are more sophisticated than you are. Ken Yang is obviously a very intelligent person. He gave a lot of uh, time and energy and a lot of thought into his operation. He led a major enterprise for many years that flew below the radar, that went undetected by law enforcement that enabled him and his partners in crime to make millions and millions of dollars. That's why he's a mastermind. Authorities estimate Ken Yang made $40 million during his 10-year car theft operation. None of it was ever recovered. Oh, yeah.